Hi there viewers, welcome back to Medieval Sewing Made Easy, Episode 2, part of this video series by Popula Urbanum. Last time we focused in detail on making a simple running stitch on some late medieval broadcloth using a wool yarn and a linen thread. We also learned some ways to e easily thread the needle and to knot off securely. Today we'll be looking at backstitch. I begin by taking my needle, which I've already threaded with a pure wool two-ply weaving yarn similar to a medieval woolen yarn. Please refer to episode 1 for instructions on how to thread your needle if you need any help with that. Here I have a small sample of some red woolen broadcloth, similar to a late medieval broadcloth because it's the period that I'm reenacting at the moment. Another cloth you might be using is a wool melton or coating uh, if you're doing that period too, but it all depends on what fabric is appropriate to the impression you're doing. Pin both ends of your seam as before. It's always a good idea to pin before you sew, in case your two cut edges are slightly different lengths. This can sometimes happen with any pattern, even a medieval one. Throw in a few pins periodically along the seam to make sure the whole length of the seam is neat and even. Bonus tip, if your edges are slightly different lengths, uh, and that's quite exaggerated, once you have pinned both ends, fold one edge in half, mark the halfway point with a pin, find the halfway point of the other edge, then pin the two halfway points together. Repeat this process by pinning together at the quarters, the eighths, and so on, and therefore the two different ed length edges will be eased together evenly before you stitch them. Now, not off. As before, just pass the needle through the work and knot off as described in episode 1. I'm working with quite a long thread here for some reason. You really don't need this much thread on your needle and in fact it can cause tang tangling, especially if you're a beginner, so don't be like me. I'm just passing the needle through three times to make it extra secure. Now. You can see where the needle emerges from the fabric after I've knotted off in a forward position. I want to place the needle back from that position to begin the first back stitch. I pay close attention to the size of the stitch before I make it. I want to keep this fairly consistent all through the seam. I pass the needle from front to back. Then, keeping the needle in the work I find a position in the forward direction but twice the distance of the first little back stitch. I pass the needle from the back to the front like that and pull the thread. I have made one back stitch Now is a good time to check tension, as before when doing a running stitch. Not too loose, not too tight. You want it just right. Now, for the next one, I'm beginning my back stitch by passing my needle through from front to back in a backward position from where it just emerged. It should pass right next to the edge of the last back stitch you made, almost through the same hole, just like that. Because I'm quite particular, I like to pay close attention to which side of the previous stitch the needle emerges from on the back of the work. As before, I then find a position in the forward direction, twice the distance of the first back stitch, pass the needle through from back to front, and pull the thread through. You can see the two back stitches laying neatly next to each other from the back of the work. There it is. Just repeating the back stitch as before, going from front to back, paying close attention to the position as it go of the needle as it goes through. This time, I'm doing the stitch in two stages to show exactly what's going on. You will notice that the stitches on the front of the work are smaller and sitting end to end, and that the stitches on the back of the work are longer, about twice as long, and overlap each other. go small stitches on the front on the top 
and large stitches on the back and just laying those stitches neatly on the back of the work there so they lay flat so now thanks to the magic of video editing we can skip to the end of the scene where you can see all the back stitches laying fairly neatly in a line at a consistent distance from the cut edge And just sort of like it just overlaps sort of like shingles on a roof at the back there but on the front they're quite straight sort of like a running stitch is straight as I stitch you can see that the thread can tend to tangle due to it being so long it's okay to just gently untangle the thread with your fingers or with the tip of your needle to free it before you continue stitching Sometimes a reproduction medieval bone awl can be very handy for this sort of task. Here we've come to the end of the seam. It's almost time to knot off again. Refer to episode 1 if you need to go back and have a look at how to do that again. Or you might have your own method of knotting off. That's the way to complete a successful back stitch. It's not as fast as a running stitch can be, however, with practice you can pick up speed. Back stitch is very good to use on any seams under strain, such as kirtle bodice seams, on hose, or men's coat hardies. My research indicates that poor points were quilted using back stitch. snip off the thread and it's finished here is the back stitch sample shown in comparison with the running stitch sample from last episode the back stitch is more supportive than the running stitch and it gapes less you can see there it doesn't gape very much the back the back stitch seam will also not unravel or pucker as easily as the running stitch seam. Here's the here's the running stitch sample. You can see that it gapes quite a lot compared to the back stitch. You can see that they perform quite differently under pressure. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Medieval Sewing Made Easy. Please feel free to comment below if you have any further tips for beginner sewers or you can share good resources for medieval sewing. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and I hope to see you in the next episode.